Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm Judy Killian, and I have the honor of serving on your board. And I haven't been up here yet this year, so from my heart to yours, Happy New Year. This afternoon at 1.30, Mike Opsatz will be doing O oh, Grow Up and Learn the Eight Tasks for Mature Wholeness workshop. Do you want to deepen your spiritual life? If so, perhaps being a prayer chaplain is right for you. To say more about this, here are Margie Black and David Belzotti. Good morning. Good morning. Each year at this time, we invite Unity members to open their hearts and minds and consider whether they are called to become a prayer chaplain. The prayer chaplain program offers an opportunity to learn more about Unity's prayer process then helps you to develop a more powerful awareness of being in sacred service um, through holding sacred space and praying with others in our spiritual community. There's no prior uh, prayer experience necessary. For me, being a prayer chaplain and connecting with another in prayer touches my heart, lifts my spirits, and expands my spiritual awareness. Because before coming to Unity Minneapolis, I didn't really pray very much. I, I tended to meditate, but not uh, pray. However, since joining the prayer chaplain program, I have found a way to pray unity and to be uh, truly grateful. For me, every prayer begins with gratitude. Gratitude for the connection with whomever I'm praying with. Gratitude um, for the love they express and gratitude that I can be present. So to recap, prayer chaplains are trained to do three things. Hold spiritual, spiritual space, listen with the ears of their heart, and pray. In short, they help to make a more personal connection with the Unity Minneapolis membership. So if the thought of becoming a prayer chaplain seems like a heart-centered calling to you, I invite you to meet David and me outside the meditation room 
uh, following this service to learn more about this opportunity to grow in spirit. Thank you. Thank you. For those interested in participating in Prosperity Plus Two class, this is the last week to join and it's on Tuesday night. During Reverend Pat's absence, Reverend Laura Smedstad is available for counseling on Wednesday afternoons by appointment and on love offering basis. She combines her professional expertise as a licensed clinical counselor with a background in new thought spirituality. For her contact information <clears throat> or to make an appointment, pick up a spiritual counseling brochure on the round table in the garden court or contact the church office. The insert in your bulletin, bringing you love and good cheer, is for Reverend Pat, and you can jot a note to him. Who's, he's currently on medical leave. Just leave your message in the basket on the table in the garden court, and we will deliver them to him. There are so many things coming up in February that we encourage you to check them out in the garden court. While there, if you haven't done so already, sign up for the Peak at the Week, which is our electronic newsletter that goes out every Thursday. The bulletin is yours to take home to refer to throughout the week. And now hey, we... Judy, yeah. hey, oh. you know, I rarely interrupt, like once every five years, so this is my last shot. But I want to tell you guys something. Um, Ian Young has been here on the base this month. He'll be here next Sunday as well. And he will be leaving Minneapolis in like two, three weeks because he just got hired to be the bass player in the international Broadway tour of Rent. Yeah. Yeah. Walk to Japan and China and the U.S. for the next year. Okay, and now we invite you to take out your electronic devices and if you're on Facebook, check in and let your people know that you're here at Unity Minneapolis. And then silence the device and give yourself and others the gift of this hour. We begin our service with prayer led by Reverend Jeanette. Thank you, sweetie. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Let's begin our, our service with prayer. We thank you, sweet spirit, for this day. We thank you for our spiritual community, for all of those present, and for those that are here uh, with us online today. We are grateful for everything in our world, despite appearances, because we know in all things you are present. And for this, we are grateful. And so it is. And so we let it be. Amen. Woohoo! Let's. Praise this glorious day. It's going to sunshine and then the snow. So this month, we call attention to our core value transforming. And we live this value by moving toward our highest good through meditation and visioning, while setting our intentions towards spiritual growth and relying on the divine presence to guide us. And we live our unity principles while consciously co-creating our lives with spirit. And let's do our core values now. We are loving, transforming, welcoming, spirit-filled, prosperous, and joyful. And our vision statement, centered in spirit, we celebrate a world transformed by love, peace, and compassion. And our mission statement, we are a vibrant, inclusive, prosperous spiritual community, inspiring and empowering full expression of the divine within through prayer, education, and service. And I invite our on-duty prayer chaplains to please stand. These individuals arrived early today to hold sacred space for us, and they are here to pray with you for any joys, concerns, celebrations you would like to pray about. They listen with the ears of their heart and hold it in the strictest of confidence. So please seek one of them out because I assure you it'll be a blessing for you as well as for them. So let's stand and sing our opening song, God You Are. Every canyon, every inch of earth and sky. 
Yes. Okay, well, now let's do one of our favorite things, and that is to greet any of our new guests. So if this is your first, second, or third time, hold your hand up like me and Lori are, and wait till our, keep your hands up until our ushers get to you. Yes, yes. Way to go, Lori. <laughs> the pamphlet that they're giving, the ushers are giving you, that is information about Unity Minneapolis and the rose you are receiving that is just from our congregation and that is so we can recognize you and give you a warm Unity welcome. So thank you. Thank you for being with us. All right. Now, the next thing we like to do, well, first of all, I want to tell you that, you know, no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. We are one of the most welcoming groups I know. It's true. Okay, so let's greet our neighbors. Greet them with a handshake, a smile, a hug, but always ask before you hug. I always do that. If you didn't get any enough time to do our, to, hello, <laughs> sorry, just kidding. Um, if you didn't get enough time to greet the one you wanted to, you can greet them in the Friendship Hall after the service and over a cup of coffee. It'll be great. Woohoo! Thank you. We're going to sing the gift of love. Probably stay seated for this. Though I may speak with bravest fire and have the gift to all inspire.
We now more, move more deeply into spirit with the reading of the daily word and the singing of Surely the Presence. As the usher brings down the prayer box, you're invited to mentally add your prayers to the written requests in the box. After the service, the prayer box is located in the garden court where you may add your written requests. Your prayers are then prayed with by a prayer ministry for seven days and then they are forwarded to Silent Unity where they are prayed with for an additional 30 days. Also, we, heard, we hold Reverend Pat, our senior pastor, in prayer while he is away on medical leave and sabbatical. The word for today is world peace. I hold a vision of peace for the entire world. I am only one person in a vast and complex world. I sometimes feel helpless in the face of global tensions and conflicts as I read and hear reports about the world's challenges. Do I have the time, wisdom, or personal resources to make a difference? Spiritual truth is much simpler than the complicated confusion in my mortal mind. I take a moment to be still and to envision a world at peace on every continent, in every nation, in every heart. Holding the vision may be all I can do in the moment, but it is more than enough. I hold this vision not as a hope, but as an intention confident in the oneness that underlies every appearance of separation and discord. Scripture says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The word for today, world peace. Can feel. 
just take some time now to clear our minds and open our hearts as we prepare for meditation. Have this time for, be for you a, to personally prepare a space in your life for more of God's love, more of God's wisdom, and more of God's aliveness. I invite you to get comfortable in your chair, leaving your hands resting gently on your lap, and if comfortable for you to close your eyes. We're gonna to begin today with becoming more conscious of our breath, a long, slow, deep breath. And exhale. The word for spirit in Hebrew is the same as the word for breath. So when we fill our bodies with breath, we experience more aliveness more warmth and more ease. So feeling your chest open and your neck relax and your shoulders let go. Take another long, slow breath. And just let go. Our breath will allow us to enter into the generosity of silence where we can hear the voice of our hidden heart, the place where spirit resides, the quiet immensity of our own presence. In this place, imagine that you can see yourself just as you are today, and see yourself as God sees you, wholly loving and wholly lovable. Imagine that a slow, warm wind has entered this room and it works its way around you as if surrounding you with words of love. It's like an invisible cloak to shelter your life and it embraces you with the things that really matter. A compassionate heart, a gracious awareness of life, courageous thoughts, generosity of love and kindness, and the richness of family and friends. Imagine that you see yourself wearing this cloak and sitting in a favorite place known only to you. It could be a memory of a favorite childhood place, a place in nature, or in a favorite room. Just give yourself permission to see it and to relax completely there. Now in this place of safety and security, you can tell yourself the truth about a particular heart's desire, something or some situation in which you can imagine yourself free of all doubt and day-to-day -day worry. Give a name to this desire and see an image of it in your mind. See it clearly now and breathe into it. And let go. Just imagining this, and because you are being truthful, you can feel the weight of the world falling away from your shoulders allowing yourself to receive God love in all forms creates a feeling of joy and peace and brings this to the temple of your senses. And when you achieve this, everyone around you benefits greatly too. Just remembering this allows you to sink deeply into a state of rest in this moment of clarity you let the music carry you gently into a space of blissful silence.
the memory of this bliss, you reawaken now to this room. You wiggle your fingers and your toes a little bit. Cup your face in your hands and feel the warmth there. Get ready to go back into your day with the ability to know the truth. You deserve to receive the love you want because God's will and your will are always the same. And God's will for you is to know and to be love itself. Amen. Well, they build their houses in preparation for the king. And they line their sidewalks with every sort of shiny thing. They will be surprised. When they hear him say, mm, take me to the alley, take me to the afflicted ones, take me to the lonely ones who somehow lost their way. Let them hear me say, I am your friend. Come to my table and rest here in my garden. You will have a pardon. They will be surprised when they hear him say, Hey, take me to the alley, take me to the afflicted ones, take me to the lonely ones who somehow lost their way. Let them hear me say, let them hear me say, I am your friend, I am your friend, come to my table, my table. rest here in my garden, you will have a pardon. Take me to the alley, take me to the afflicted ones, take me to the lonely ones who somehow lost their way, like we somehow do, oh, let them hear me say. right on up to my table rest here in my garden you will have a pardon
take me to the afflicted one. Take me to the alley. Thank you, as always, for such wonderful music. Good morning, everyone. The other evening, on Tuesday evening, at our Prosperity Plus class, we were having difficulty with the video trying to get it to work. And after several of us worked on it for a while, we were, we were, we were just almost ready to just let it go and just do the audio CD of Mary Morrissey instead of watching her on, on the video. But at the last second, just as we were about to let go of that, it started to work. And several students in the class started going, Skoll! Skoll! <laughs> I see we have some football fans here in the crowd. And some of us will be watching this afternoon. One Saturday evening... A certain minister was in his study at the church, at a church called the Almighty God Tabernacle, working on his Sunday sermon. He was just finishing up and thought that he'd give his wife a call and let her know that he was going to be on his way home soon. <clears throat> so he called her, but there was no answer. It rang and rang and rang, nothing. He thought, well, that's odd. I don't think she's planned to be out anywhere, but he hung up the phone, finished putting away his materials, and just as he was about to go out the door, called again. This time she answered on the first ring. And he told her he was going to be home and said, you know, were you out somewhere? She said, no, I've been home all evening. So he said he'd called, and she said, no, this, the phone hasn't rung at all. So they both just didn't know what had happened and let it go. Monday morning, he was back in his office when the phone rang. <clears throat> the voice on the other end of the phone said, did you try to call me Saturday evening? The minister said, I didn't call anybody. I'd called my wife, but that's it. He said, well, someone called from there. The phone rang and rang, and I just let it ring. The minister said, oh, now I remember. I must have dialed your number by mistake. I am so terribly sorry to have bothered you. He's, the voice on the other end of the phone said, No need to apologize. <clears throat> I was getting ready to kill myself on Saturday evening. And I said out loud, God, if you are there, send me a sign. Just then, the phone started to ring. I looked at my caller ID, and I saw Almighty God. <laughs> and I was too scared to answer the phone. <laughs> well, the minister and the man had a nice conversation. He actually came in. They found a counselor for this man, and it turned out he didn't commit suicide after all. But I thought it was a wonderful example of God's love in action. The title of my lesson this morning is Opening to the Wonderful Love of God. So much of traditional religion is based on fear and guilt. But this is not at all what Jesus taught. The word gospel actually means good news. And it turns out that the good news is even way better than we thought. First of all, there's no such thing as an eternal roasting oven. <laughs> With our understanding of and knowledge of Aramaic, the language of Jesus, we know that hell is a current day experience of separation from God and each other. Just as heaven is likewise a current experience of oneness with God and other people. Secondly, everyone 
is destined to make it. Everyone is destined to live in the kingdom of heaven sooner or later. Because, first of all, what Jesus says in Matthew 18 is, it is not our Father's wish that even one of these should be lost. Someone in a 12-step group once said to me, he said, religion is for people who are afraid of going to hell. Spirituality is for those of us who've already been there. I don't know about you, but that sure applies to me. Bishop Spong, Bishop John Shelby Spong, the wonderful Bible scholar, once said, the message of Jesus is very clear. There is absolutely nothing that we can do that could ever separate us from the love of God. Alan Cohen, in one of his later books, told the story of when he, just after writing his first book called The Dragon Doesn't Live Here Anymore, he gave a copy of the book to his mother. And after she read it, she called Alan and she said, Alan, did you actually do all those things that you say you do it that you say you did in your book? He said, Yes, Mom, I did. Did you really get naked with a bunch of people you didn't know and dance on the beach in California? Yes, Mom, yes I did. Did you really take LSD in St. Louis and climb on the roof of the planetarium there? and scare a whole pack of Cub Scouts by looking into the <laughs> telescope that they were looking out of? <laughs> yes, Mom, I did that. <laughs> did you really try and do in your roommate in college by sprinkling cologne from the bottom of his bed all the way out the door and then in the hallway lighting it? Yes, Mom, I did that too. Do you still love me? After a moment's pause, she said, Well, of course I still love you. I'm your mother. What choice do I have? <laughs> and that is our relationship with spirit. As Bishop Spong said, the message of Jesus is very clear. There is absolutely nothing that we can do that could ever separate us from the love of God. Just as God is our loving Father, so God is also our loving Mother. Bishop Tutu, he of the Nobel Prize, once said, I actually only have one sermon, and it's always about how much God loves us. This lesson today is all about opening to and receiving that love. This is what Jesus taught. Over and over again, how much Spirit loves us and how to receive that wonderful love. In Matthew 7, 7, Jesus says, Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. I sometimes like to point out what he didn't say. He didn't say, Ask and you might receive. He didn't say, seek, and sometimes you'll find something. He didn't say, knock, and every once in a while a door will open. He said it happens every time. And then in the Lord's Prayer, he taught us to ask that God's will be done in our life. In my childhood church, I grew up being afraid of God's will. But fortunately, I found unity and A Course in Miracles. And I love this phrase in A Course in Miracles which says, fear of the will of God is the strangest thing that mankind ever came up with. In Aramaic, again, the language of Jesus, we learn that God's will means God's desire, God's wish, God's want. 
Spirit is our loving creator, our loving inner parent. And those of you who are parents, I'd like to ask, what's your desire for your children? Of course, you want health for them. You want happiness for them. You want prosperity for them. You want fulfillment. And you don't just want it for one or two of them if you have more than that. You want it for every single one of them. This is what God or Spirit wants for us all. Again, in Matthew 7, verse 9, Jesus says, What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? There are cultural things that I don't have time to go into this morning that, that's the reason for those for talking about scorpions and serpents. And he says, if you then, being immature, know how to give good gifts to your children, imagine how much more your heavenly Father will give those who ask. And in Jesus' parables, they're all about living in the kingdom of heaven. And of course, we know that the kingdom of heaven is here and now, right? It's, here and now, it's a here and now experience. Dr. Rocco Errico, the Aramaic Bible scholar, says what, what, the, what Jesus' use of the phrase the kingdom of heaven means is an experience of oneness with God. Several of his parables are all about, well, let me say that several of his parables, for example, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost sheep, and the parable, the beloved parable of the prodigal son, are all about how much spirit wants us to live in heaven. And of course, that means here and now. Jack Boland, who is no longer with us on earth, but who for years and years had the largest unity church in the country, he used to like to say, several of you talk about having a God experience. He said, I'd like you to know something. God wants to have a you experience. One of my favorite parables of Jesus is one that we might call a hidden parable. In some of Jesus' parables, he actually portrays God as a woman. In that male-dominated culture, this was a completely revolutionary idea. And it's the reason why this parable is hidden. The story is about, and it comes from Luke 18, the story is called, often called the parable of the importunate widow or the parable of the unjust judge. In the story, a certain widow goes to ask for a judge if he will help her with, with a certain case. And the judge is called an unjust judge. According to Dr. Errico, that means he's a judge on the take to the highest bidder. So the widow goes to his house late at night. She knocks and knocks and knocks and knocks on the door. And the judge says to himself, even though I have no regard either for God or for people, yet I will answer the door and let this woman in and give her what she wants because otherwise she will never leave me alone. So the gospel writer finishes this parable by saying, thus taught Jesus that we ought always to pray and not to faint. But that interpretation doesn't make any sense. It is not at all what Jesus taught in saying, ask and you will receive every single time. Dr. Erico says, not even the disciples understood this parable. And, and he continues, why would Jesus portray God as a judge who's on the take? That doesn't make any sense. And he says, we have had this parable, this story, exactly backwards. It's not the judge who represents God. It's the widow. 
It's the widow who knocks and knocks and knocks on the door of our heart. And he says, this is very much like the end of Psalm 23. We know most of us have heard this ending of Psalm 23 a lot, where it says, surely goodness and mercy, right? Shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Dr. Erico said, that word follow in that last phrase is not nearly strong enough. In both Hebrew and Aramaic, it would go something like this. Surely, goodness and mercy will chase me, will torment me, will hunt me down, and will never leave me alone until I say yes to it. Aren't you glad? That is the wonderful love of God. Spirit is constantly knocking on the door of our heart. Our job is to be open to receive that love. So I'm going to invite you to affirm something with me this morning, and that is, I open my heart to receive all the love Spirit wants me to have. Together, I open my heart to receive all the love Spirit wants me to have. So how do we receive God's unconditional love? I'd like to share four thoughts, four ways this morning with you. And what I invite you to do is choose one of the four, if you decide to do so, to focus on this week as one way that you can open more fully to receive God's love. Whichever one of these four speaks to you the most this morning. The first way we can practice receiving God's love is that we can practice surrendering to God every day. In Matthew 5, that first beatitude, most of us learned it like this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Dr. Eric was teacher, Dr. George Lamza, who grew up in Kurdistan and spoke Aramaic as his native language, says that's a really poor translation. That word that we translate as blessed are the poor in spirit, the word is ruha for spirit. And it means several things, including pride. So in his version, Dr. Lamza changed that verse to say, blessed are the poor in pride, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But Dr. Erico said, Lamb's a student, he said, if I were to write this in modern language, I would say it like this. Delighted, overjoyed, are those who surrender to God, for theirs is God's constant counsel. So that's one way we practice opening to God's love. We practice surrendering to God daily. The second way we can receive, practice receiving God's love is we can practice receiving love from everybody in our life. Have you ever been with someone who wouldn't receive your love? Anybody? How'd that feel? Not very good, does it? A certain other minister that I was reading about this week talked about an experience he had when he was a young man, about 24, and he was an associate minister at a certain church, and he was leading, one weekend he was leading a marriage encounter group, and after that, one of the women who had been there with her husband told him that what he had said had been really helpful to her. And the young minister said, well, you know, it wasn't me. It was actually God speaking. The young woman said back to him, why do you ministers say such stupid things after someone just tries to give you a compliment? She said, I know ultimately the credit is God's, and I wasn't trying to worship you, I was trying to thank you. Well, he felt like his ears were being you know, pinned back, and he said, I get it. <laughs> that was the last time, he said, that he refused to receive someone's love who was just trying to offer him a compliment. My wife, Laura, likes to say, and used to say this about our kids, well, still does, 
that as, as important as it is to love our children fully, it's even more important to receive their love. Because when we do that, we teach them that they are important, that they matter, that they have something that's valuable to give. The third way we practice receiving God's love is we practice asking for and listening to our guidance. Mary Morrissey tells a story about someone who was in her church when she had her large church in Oregon. This woman was having a difficult time finding a job, and she was beginning to feel more and more desperate and depressed. One evening, there was a singles potluck scheduled at the church, and this woman just felt this inner nudge that she should go to this potluck, but she didn't feel like it. She didn't feel good. She felt depressed. She didn't want to get dressed up. She thought she'd stay home. But that nudge wouldn't go away. It just kept saying, go to the potluck. So after about three or four times, and by this time it was after the potluck had already supposed to start it, finally she said, all right, all right, I'll go. So she took a quick shower, got dressed, stopped at the store, got some chips and dip, went to the potluck. And when she got there, since she was so late, there was only one chair left. It turned out that she was sitting right next to a man who needed a person with her very set of skills at his company. And by going there, she was able to land the job that she wanted. She said, God was trying to love me. All I had to do was to, to say yes to that love. And the final way that I want to tell you, talk about this morning about receiving the way to receive God's love is to practice extending your love to everybody in your life. We don't love people to make points with God. We do so as a way to receive God's love. In Matthew 5, verses 43 to 45, Jesus says, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. In other words, so that you may experience your oneness with God. Because, he said, God makes the rain to fall on the just and on the unjust. He makes the sun to shine on the immature and on the mature. So if you want to practice being one with God, the way to do it is to allow Spirit's love to continue to flow through you toward everybody in your life. So we don't love others because they deserve it. And of course they deserve it. They're members of our one divine family. We love them because we deserve to be in love all day, every day. So let this week... Be all about opening your heart to God's wonderful love, receiving love and extending it everywhere because you deserve to live a life of constantly being in love, in love with God. And so it is. Let's, uh, you know, I was speaking with a prayer chaplain after the first service, and I said, I don't think I'm a rule breaker, but I'm a boundary pusher. <laughs> so it's true, I have a tiny little Vikings logo here. <laughs> Kate brought it home for me the other day, and I said, oh. I might wear that to church. And she said, I thought you could probably wear it to church. And I said, I'm going to. So it's kind of breaking the rules. So forgive me. Uh -huh. And then we're going to do a song in 11.8. Don't be scared. Okay. 
It's great. The f they got it the first service, didn't they? So when we go like this, uh, uh, that's it. Yeah, you got it? You can clap, clap, uh, uh, it'll grow on you. Lord, you know how often I'm confused And you know how often I've been used But I keep my mind on you unless I should be disturbed and lose your rest Often I am robbed of peace of mind Often I'm tempted to be unkind Try to keep my mouth shut cause it's best Focusing my mind on you means rest. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I have lived a life of careless ease. I've been doing whatever I please And done what your word is best And the things that you say will bring rest Now I've turned and I'm facing the light And I'm living life with all my might I know being near you is the best Love God and your neighbor be at rest Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm leaning on your arm, yes indeed, Lord. Oh, without your arm, I can't make it. Oh, I won't make it, oh, Lord. No, place <laughs> isn't it <laughs> okay now it's time for our offertory blessing so if you have been blessed by the music the meditation the lesson or all of them in any way we invite you to give your love offering now and if you're giving it together hold it together or else hold it in your hands and in, with those that are live streaming, you too can give on a secure website. There's a little button on your screen you could, for you to give as well. So let's say our, our offertory blessing. I will say it first. 
then we'll say it together, and then we'll say it in silence. Divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies all that I give, all that I receive, and all that I am. Together, divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies all that I give, all that I receive, and all that I am. And in silence. Thank you. Praise God. We bless these gifts and these offerings. We bless the people that have given them. We thank you, sweet spirit, for all of these gifts so that Unity Minneapolis can continue to do that which we are called to do. And so it is. And so we let it be. Amen. So let's bring the children in. Ministry is one of the first five initiatives in our strategic plan that we're starting with in 2018. And I have a request for all of you. Our strategic planning team is meeting tomorrow night. And I would love it if you would hold in prayerful consideration the right and perfect outcome as we're imagining a new youth and family ministry. Um, it's an unknown now, which is so cool because it's limitless then. Hold that for us as we create a wonderful program for our young people. Thank you. And let's give a hand to these adult volunteers. <laughs> Let us say our prayer for protection. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. And the presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is and all is well.
just a boy, a wayfaring stranger. Seems I'm journeying through a world of woe, and there's no sickness, no toil, no danger. To which I go